this evening, we're going to look at 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. So there was a choice. There was a decision that the people had to make. And, you know, we're faced with decisions on a regular basis. Every day uh, we have decisions that we have to make. I want to go over a, a account that happened back in January 14th of 2003. There was a Dallas Cowboy football player named Dwayne Lewis Goodrich. And he decided early in the morning, 1245 in the morning, to go to a strip club. That was a choice. He, had, he could either go or not go. He chose to go. He stayed there for a couple of hours, partaking of whatever vices go on in those kind of places. And he made a choice when he left to get in his car and drive down the road at excess, estimated excess speeds of 100 miles an hour. And so that was a choice to drive in whatever condition he was in. I don't know if he was drinking or what, but he made that choice to get in the car and drive home. He made the choice how fast he was going to go. And it turns out that he ran up on an automobile accident and he had a choice. He could either slam on the brakes and try to stop or he could swerve and try to uh, wind his way through the wreckage. Well, he chose to try to swerve and wind his way through. And when he swerved, he went around the wreckage and come up on three men that were trying to pull an injured person out of a burning vehicle and he struck all three men, killing two. Bad choice. Bad decision. And then he could make the choice to stop and render aid or continue on, and he chose to continue on. Now, do you think that when he chose to go to that strip club at 1245 in the morning, that he intended to kill two people? No, but... He chose that. Do you think when he got in his car and was driving 100 miles an hour, he intended to kill two people? No. Do you think when he swerved rather than hit the brakes that he intended to kill two people? No. But that's what he did, and he's going to have to live with that the rest of his life. Choices, decisions that we make. You know, some decisions that we make not, may not seem at the time that critical, but if we don't think things through properly, one decision can lead to destruction. It may seem like to be an innocent decision. He never imagined that he would end up killing two people when he decided to go to that strip club. But that was the first decision that led to other bad decisions that ultimately ended up killing two people. And he was responsible. We face choices every day of our life. The decisions we make determine what we are going to do and they're going to determine the course of our life. And not only our life, but sometimes our decisions affect people around us as well. So let's look at some decisions that we need to make that we really can't afford to get wrong. You know, we have some examples of decision making in the Bible. We read one at the beginning when we looked at the passage where they were, they were, uh, Stuck between two opinions. Some uh, uh, translations have decisions, two decisions. To do one thing or another. Or accept God as, as God, Jehovah as God, or Baal, which, whichever one, pick one and serve him. They were trying to straddle the fence and, and hold on to Jehovah while worshiping Baal at the same time. That's like a split decision. We can't, we can't, 
ride the fence on some issues. It's either or. We're not allowed to, to be neutral. Just like in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, when Eve was presented with a choice. And regardless of what really went on there, we have that account in Genesis chapter 3, regardless of what the account says, the choice boiled down to this, is Eve going to obey God or disobey? That's really what was at stake, right? Right? Are you going to obey God? Are you going to trust what he says? Are you going to believe Satan's lie and then turn and disobey God? Well, we know how that turned out, right? Adam was presented a choice as well. He was there with her while she was being tempted. He saw what she did. He listened to the conversation. And he was presented a choice when she turned to give him the fruit. His choice was to obey God or disobey God, and he chose to disobey God. Noah. Noah's an amazing man. In all of his generation, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord when no one else did. And God presented him with a task to build the ark. Because there was going to be a flood that would destroy all life on earth except the life that was in the ark. And God said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to build the ark. I want it to be this long, this wide, this high, this many floors, this many doors, this many windows. I want it to be pitched within and without. And that's what I want you to do. Get busy. So once again, we see Noah presented with a decision. He could decide to obey God and live or disobey God and die. That's the choice he was presented. But at the end of Genesis chapter 6, the very last verse said, everything that God commanded Noah, so did he. He made that decision to obey God to the saving of himself and his household and, 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 and the animal life that exists on the world today. Joshua, we're all familiar with Joshua's statement in his farewell, farewell address in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. He challenges the people, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which, you, uh, which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Joshua had already made his decision. He's going to serve the Lord, and he's challenging the people. To do the same. You know we have those same choices. Every day don't we? Whether we're going to obey or disobey. Are we going to be like Adam and Eve. And be disobedient. Or are we going to be like Noah and obey. Are we going to be like Joshua. And serve the Lord. Or are we going to serve other gods. See those are decisions. That we have to make. These are decisions we can't get wrong. These are decisions that have eternal consequences. Every situation in the Bible is an example of a decision being made. The day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Remember that? They preached the first gospel sermon. Peter's sermon is recorded there for us. We get down uh, to verse 37. They cry out. They're pricked in the heart. They cry out, many brethren, what shall we do? Peter tells them, repent ye and be baptized every one of you for remission of sin. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then in verse 40, he exhorts them, saying, Save yourselves from this wicked and untoward generation. They had a decision to make. 
Verse 41, they that gladly received the word made the right decision, made the right choice. They that gladly received the word were baptized. It was added to them about 3,000 souls. So 3,000 people on that day made the right choice. They, they came to a, a decision to do the right thing. And we have decisions that we need to make. You know, everybody, as you grow up, the older you get, the, the more this comes to bear on your life. We have to make the decision of who our friends are going to be. Who our friends are going to be. You might think, well, that's a pretty simple thing. Just go out and find people that we have things in common with and it's going to be okay, right? But it doesn't always work out that way. Christians are supposed to be different from the world. Now, if we're going to use that criteria, then our friends need to be what? Need to be Christians. And that's the way it ought to be. We have a fellowship. We have something in common with Christians that we'll never have in common with the world. And yet many Christians go out and make friends of the world. Some of the people that are in the Lord's church have Closer friends outside the church than they have inside the church. And that's unfortunate because according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33, says what? Be not deceived. See, it's easy to be fooled by this. There are a lot of people in the world that may seem to be good moral people. We may have a lot of things in common. We work together, maybe at recreation. Maybe we like to fish or golf or hunt or whatever. We, we, you know, we find people that we have common interests in like that. And we, we naturally become close to those people. Is that what we ought to do? See, that's that part of that deception be not deceived. Satan will take our closest friends, wrap them up and make them look really good and, and, and make it attractive to be friends with them. And then he'll turn around and use those very friends to get us to compromise the truth, to go back into the world. That's why Paul here says, be not deceived. Evil communication corrupts good manners. It's easier for our worldly friends to pull us away from the church than it is to pull them to the church. Does that mean we can't have friends in the world? No, but we need to be careful who we choose lest they lead us astray. It's very easy. That's why in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11 it says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. It's very easy for us to compromise the truth when we have closer friends, closer ties to people in the world than we have closer ties to people in the church. But too often it's that way. Too often it is that way. People have closer ties to the world than the church. Here's another one. And I've seen this one happen a few times. What about choosing where we're going to live? You think about that? Something that simple. While I was preaching in Little Rock, Arkansas, there was a couple that worshipped in North Little Rock, and the congregation over there was drifting toward liberalism. There were some uncertain sounds coming from the pulpit and they began to be concerned. And so they drove all the way across Little Rock to Lawrence Drive where I was preaching at the time and started worshiping with us. Now this couple were making pretty good money. He worked for the railroad, made good money. And they always, especially her, had a desire to have a nice home. 
They already had it planned out. They had the design. They had the, the architect draw up a set of blueprints and they were ready to go. And all they needed was a piece of land. And they came in one Sunday evening and said, oh, we've been out looking at property and we found the perfect place. God's really blessed us with this. We found a contractor. He's going to build a, the house for us, blah, blah, blah. And I, says, I said, how do you know God put that choice in front of you? And they kind of looked funny. And they said, what do you mean? Surely God put this in for us because this is what we've been wanting. And I said, well, did you check out the church in that area? Because they were moving pretty far away. It was going to be unable to drive back to where we are. And I knew the situation with the church around Little Rock, and I was pretty confident there wasn't a sound congregation within driving distance of where they were wanting to move. And they kind of got a funny look on their faith, and they said, no. And I said, well, don't you think you ought to check the condition of the church in that area. You just left a congregation that has started to drift to come here because we're sound. And now you're going to move to a place and you haven't even investigated the condition of the church in that area. Guess who was right? Was it a blessing from God or was it a temptation from Satan? Well, Satan had his hand in that. They built a house over there, moved over there, no place to worship. When we think about moving, it's not about a choice piece of property. It's not about our dream home. It's maybe not even about having a better job. A lot of people move. Well, I'm going to go over there and they have a, a good job for me. I'm going to make all kind of money. Have you checked the church out over there in that area where you're going to be moving for, for work? You know, James talks about those people that decided to move to another city and to buy and sell and get gain, right? What was their problem? They made a decision. What was their problem? They didn't include the Lord in that decision. There's nothing wrong with moving to a new location. But you need to make sure that when you do move, that you have something to go to regarding the church that's sound. Otherwise, you're going to get yourself in a bind. So, you know, if you move to an area, there's no congregation. What's your choice? You have to start a congregation in that area. Unfortunately, not everybody is in a position where they're comfortable trying to do that. Therefore, what do they need to do? They need to make sure of the condition of the church before they make that decision. Your friends can affect your eternal destiny. Where you live can affect your ability to worship God and, and, and in the end affect your eternal destiny. These decisions may seem simple. They may be ordinary. They may be everyday things that we do. But as we saw in our illustration of the Dallas Cowboy football player, one decision leads to another, to another, to another, to another. And sometimes you have disastrous results. What about how much we give? We make that decision every Sunday morning. Actually, we ought to make that decision beforehand. We shouldn't wait till Sunday morning to make that decision. A lot of people, uh, they, they wait till they get here Sunday morning. They look in there, well, I don't know. I don't have much in there today. So, you know, get here and, and start writing the check. Look at their bottom line on their bank account. Well, what, what can I give? That's not the way we're supposed to give. God commands how we are to give. It's not an optional matter. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints. 
as have I given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, and last time I checked, every week has a first day, right? Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. So here we have the day we're supposed to give, when, every first day, and then we have a little insight into how much we're supposed to give as God has prospered us. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 7, Therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. See, so he starts out, what was that song we just sang? Can't count your blessings? Didn't we just sing that song? Isn't that what he's talking about here? Seeing you've had all these blessings. All this, God's bestowed all these great, this grace on you in these various ways. Then don't you think you ought to abound in this grace also? Abound. What if God handed out blessings the way we hand out our contribution? You ever think about that? If God gave to us the way we give to him, then he may be cutting back on some of his blessings. Right? We wouldn't, we wouldn't like that, would we? 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. But this I say, he which sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he which sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully every man according as he's purposed in his heart. There's what I was talking about. This is a decision that needs to be made ahead of time. We need to determine ahead of time what we're going to give based on how we've prospered and how the Lord has blessed us. That's how, we, that's how we need to make the decision on how much we're going to give. It shouldn't be an afterthought. Our giving needs to be sacrificed. David said, I'll, never, I'll not give a sacrifice that doesn't cost me anything. When we give, are we sacrificing? Do we give sacrificially? Are we giving things up so that we can give more to the Lord? So it goes on. Every man according to his purpose in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So when we give, it needs to be as we prospered on the first day of the week. It needs to be determined ahead of time. It needs to be based on the blessings that God has given us. It needs to be sacrificial. Understanding that the work of the Lord, notice what it says, if we sow sparingly, we're going to reap sparingly. If we sow bountifully, we'll reap bountifully. Now in that context, he's not talking about the, the uh, prosperity gospel. Like these televangelists try to pass off on us. See, they'll use these passages like this and say, yeah, see there, you can't outgive God. Have you ever heard somebody say that? If you hear somebody say you can't outgive God, you better watch out. We, see, we give, the more we give, the more God's going to give back. No, that's not the way it works. We give based on what God's already given us. Not in, in hope of future remuneration. No. We give cheerfully. We ought to be happy to give. That God's blessed us to the point where we can give. We need to give generously. We need to give with purpose. We don't need to give grudgingly. Now well, here we go again. It's time to take up a collection. What am I going to give? 
No, it's not that. We need to be cheerful. We don't give because we have to. We give because we want to. So what's this sparingly and bountifully talking about really? He's talking about the work of the church. The work that the church can do in evangelism, edification, and benevolence is directly proportional in what we give. If we don't give much, then the church can't do much. If we give a lot, the church can do more. And these are all things that we need to take into consideration when we give. Don't forget the widow's mites. Not mice. I was preaching on this one time, and I said the widow's mites, and a lady had brought her mother with her, and they got home and said, I don't know about that preacher of yours. She said, what do you mean? She said, I don't think he knows the Bible. She said, why not? Well, he just kept talking about a, a widow feeding two mice. And she said, I've never read that in the Bible anywhere. And it's not mice, it's mites, it's money. It's small, the smallest coin that's there. And the text says Jesus was sitting over by the treasury watching what people put in. Think about that. When Jesus sat by the treasury. He knew what was being put in. When we pass the collection plate, Jesus knows what we put in. Some people were given a lot. Some people, like the widow, was giving very little. And Jesus, when she put those two, what we would call pennies, two cents. We don't have pennies, by the way. We have cents. Two cents. In the collection plate. Jesus says her contribution was more than anybody else's. Surprised everybody that heard that. Might surprise some of us here. How could two pennies be worth more than all these big, generous contributions? Well, Jesus said because they gave of their abundance and she gave of her living sacrifice. It cost her to give. Some people give and it doesn't cost them anything. Old Testament examples. The Jews were to give a tenth. Actually, if you figure out all the other uh, contributions and taxes and things that they made, it's more than 10%. But then we come up into Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20, and Jesus said, except your, your uh, uh, faith exceeds that of the... Your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees and scribes. You shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. They gave a tenth. What are we supposed to give? Give sacrificially. I heard one preacher say, I start at 10% and go up. That was his way of dealing with that. The next one. And this is a pretty important one. Not that the other ones aren't important. But who are we going to marry? Who are we going to choose to spend the rest of our life with? You know, when we think about friendship and how a friend can influence you and pull you away from Christ, what about your spouse? That's the closest relationship that you're going to have on earth, even closer than your mother and father to their child. Or the child back to their mother and father. This is, this is your your core of your family that we're talking about. So you have a Christian, they're planning on getting married, who should they choose? What's the, what's the really, what, what does it boil down to? What's the choice? Marry a Christian or a non-Christian? Now I will say this, the Bible does not teach that it is a sin for a Christian to marry a non-Christian. Okay? It's not necessarily a sin Right? And so they can choose to marry a non-Christian. But is that wise? Is that a good choice? Can I have friends that are not Christians? Yes. But is it wise? You see, there sometimes there's choices that are either or. 
but there's a better choice to be made. And here, when we're talking about choosing a mate for life, there's the choice. It can be good and wise, or it can be poor and foolish. And it's not hard when we think about a Christian choosing a mate to come to the understanding that they need to choose another Christian and marry a Christian. It's not hard to look at that. Why would a Christian wish, wish to join themselves with someone who does not have the same aim and desire as they do? When I choose a mate, the person that's going to have more influence in my life than anybody else, I need to choose somebody that's going to help me get to heaven and not hinder me to get to heaven. Young people need to, to sit down with the person that they're considering and talk about issues they're gonna, that are going to come up about what are your plans for your life in general? What job do you plan to have? How much money do you make? Right? What about children? Do you want to have children? How many children? Where do you live? We already talked about that somewhat. You live with your parents. Do you have an apartment? Do you have a house? Are you satisfied with the living conditions you're in? They sound like simple things. But they're important. Where do you worship? If they're not a Christian, they may worship in some denomination. They may not worship at all. They may be an atheist. If we have children, where are we going to, how are we going to raise them? Are we going to raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, as the Bible says? Oh, I guess not, because you're an atheist. Oh, I guess not, you're in a denomination. And they wouldn't know the nurture and admonition of the Lord if it came up and bent them. See, these are important things. These things, these issues need to be discussed before marriage is even contemplated. And that list could go on and on, couldn't it? Exactly. If you marry a non-Christian... Sooner or later, you're going to have difficulty. And sooner or later, you're going to have problems with your father-in-law. Who's your father-in-law? Not the guy in the flesh. Father-in-laws are the devil. Spiritually speaking, you can have one of two fathers. You either have God as your father or as Jesus said to those in his time, you are of your father the devil. If a Christian marries a non-Christian, their spiritual father is the devil. And if you're a woman and you're marrying a non-Christian, then you're going to have the devil as the head of your house and the one that's going to bring up your children. Is that the kind of influence you want to raise your children in? These are all important things. I'm just get all goo goo eyes and run out and marry somebody because they look good. Sometimes that's about all the investigation our young people are making when they choose a mate. And was there any wonder why most marriages end in divorce? Because we don't ask these questions so that we can make an informed decision. Sometimes a Christian can convert a non-Christian. Even the Bible talks about that. A woman by her influence and her godly behavior can win the soul of their husband to Christ. But that's really the exception to the rule. Generally speaking, it's easier for somebody to pull you away from the church than you to pull them to the church. 
We've already talked about where to live and how that might relate to job hunting, but let's talk about that. Where am I going to work? What am I going to do for a living? You know, there are a lot of jobs out there that require the employee to participate in immoral activity. Well, give me an example. Well, prostitution comes to mind right away, right? And that's obvious. And I said that somewhat facetiously. But what about working down at the grocery store? Or at the convenience store? Let's go just talk about the convenience store. Just pick one in the area. What do they sell there? Most everyone sells alcohol, right? Should Christians be involved in selling alcohol? What else do they sell there? Lottery tickets or cigarettes. Somebody hired somebody to say cigarettes. How about that? Should a Christian be involved in selling cigarettes? Should Christians be involved in selling lottery tickets? What about condoms? Condoms can be used as a prophylactic in marriage. It can be used to, as a prophylactic in premarital sex. What about zigzag papers? You know what zigzag papers are? It's what you roll up marijuana cigarettes in. Nobody rolls their own cigarettes anymore. And even if they did, who would want to sell things that help people roll cigarettes? Or roll marijuana cigarettes. See, we, we, we don't think about these things. I need a job. I must go down and work there. I, I can get a job there. Now apply that across the board to other places of employment. Waitress at a restaurant required to serve alcoholic beverages. Not all restaurants serve alcoholic beverages, but many do. Could a Christian be involved in a job where they would serve alcoholic drinks to individuals? And if, if a Christian could work in a restaurant as a waitress and occasionally sell an alcoholic beverage, could she work in a bar and do the same thing? If not, why not? Remember the football player we talked about? Where did he start out? Making his decision. In a strip club where they sold alcohol, had immoral activities. See, there's a lot of jobs that people don't think, could I work in a brewery where they make beer? Could I work in a distillery if I was in Kentucky and make bourbon? Could I work for the distributor as a truck driver or in the warehouse distributing alcohol to the places that sell it? Do we think about that when we get a job? Not to mention the fact, what about the hours I work and the days I work? There are some people, and we've dealt with this here, well, we've had some people obey the gospel and then they claim they can't come to any services because of their job. Should a Christian take a job that never allows them to worship God in the assembly or attend any Bible class in the assembly? Should a Christian have that kind of a job? How about that? See, there's, there's things we need to consider when we're looking for work and the kind of work we're going to be doing. What about the person that is in biological science? Could they work in an abortion clinic? Should a doctor work in an abortion clinic? Should they work where they have in vitro fertilization, where they help people uh, conceive, but they end up with dozens of viable embryos that they have to destroy? 
So we, we need to think about those things. Young people fixing to go to college or in college, they're getting a degree that's going to help them get a job that's going to affect the rest of their life. What kind of job can I get with the degree that I'm pursuing? And what path in life is that going to lead me down? Is it going to cause me to compromise my faith? Living a moral life. That's a choice we have to make just about every day. We can decide to add the Christian graces to our lives or not. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. And, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and virtue knowledge and knowledge temperance and a temperance patience and a patience godliness and a godliness brotherly kindness and a brotherly kindness charity we can either do that or not on the other hand we can make the decision to live according to the works of the flesh or the fruit of the spirit in galatians chapter 5 verse 19 through 23 it says and the works of the flesh are manifest they're obvious which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, rash, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, reveling, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not enter the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, godliness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So we have choices when it comes to morality. And these choices sometimes come up and present themselves every day and sometimes quite often every day. And it's good to sit down and consider some of these things that we may have to deal with ahead of time and make those decisions before we get into the heat of the moment and have to make that decision under pressure. Premarital sex, make the decision, I'm not going to do it. Get in that situation, stop, I'm not going to go there. Am I going to take drugs? Before I get in the situation where somebody's pressuring me to take drugs, nope, not going to do that. Am I going to take my first drink of alcohol? Make the decision when it, before the time comes when somebody's trying to put a drink in your hand. Nope, I'm not going to do that. Am I going to smoke a cigarette? Chew tobacco? Dip snuff? Smoke a pipe? Smoke cigars? Nope, not going to do that. Make that decision before the pressure's on. And we can go on and on. All those things we talked about earlier. Make those decisions ahead of time. And that way you're ready not to compromise when you're under pressure. Then here's a really important decision that we all have to make. And that's the decision to become a Christian. We've already talked about Peter encouraged those on Pentecost to become Christians, Acts chapter 2 and verse 40. With many other words, he exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves this wicked and perverse generation. You make that decision to obey the gospel or not. Every time we give the invitation, you have that decision before you. And as a Christian, if you've gone back into sin, when we make that invitation, you have to make the decision, am I going to respond by repenting and praying or not? And once I become a Christian and I'm a faithful Christian, then I have the choice of whether or not I'm going to go out and evangelize. Or if I'm going to edify my brethren or help the needy. Worship and serve God. Those are all decisions that I have to make as a Christian. You make the decision ahead of time. So we have our lesson before us. We could go on and on with other things, right? But this gives us the idea. 
And really it boils down to at this point in our lesson to offer the invitation and make the decision yours whether or not to obey the gospel or as a Christian that's gone back into sin to repent and pray. So we offer that invitation. The choice is yours. The decision is yours. If you're subject to the invitation to come forward or not, it's up to you.